Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Making Milestones podcast. Today's podcast is exciting because we have a special guest, and we will be talking about equine nutrition with an equine nutrition professional, Scott Seisler from Mad Barn Nutrition. Mad Barn is a Canadian equine supplement company, and they have a lot of great products, and they also ship to the U.S. and Canada, and they've done a ton of research on equine nutrition and have just a ton of free, great resources, including free diet analysis for horses um, and all sorts of stuff. I'm going to let Scott introduce himself again and then we're going to jump right into it and asking him questions because there's so much stuff for people to learn regarding equine nutrition so scott take it away all right uh my name is scott ceasler and i am the owner and founder of mad barn and uh, i guess the head lead nutritionist although these days it doesn't seem like i do as much nutrition work as i used to uh, as we have a whole team of nutritionists now who do the vast majority of the nutrition work uh, i started mad barn seven years ago now um really as a way to dive into research that I wanted to do uh, in relation to horses. So I didn't want to have to be handcuffed by uh, asking for dollars from companies or from government agencies to do some of the fundamental research I think is so necessary in the horse industry, particularly as it relates to nutrition, obviously. Um, and so this gave me the avenue to do that. And the premise behind Mad Barn really was that provide products that every horse owner essentially needs. Uh, don't uh, be selling a bunch of stuff that they don't need. And then if we provide tremendous value and great service, uh, hope was obviously people would uh, purchase our products and then we could use the money from that to drive some of our research, which is now the fundamental research I'm speaking about is now finally getting it off the ground. Uh, in, well, I guess it's seven years later, but uh, in earnest, it's really getting getting going now. So it's it's quite exciting now. We have a whole team of nutritionists. You know, it started out it was just me, and uh, you know, the first employee came on about uh, six or eight months later, and now we're a team of over I think uh, around twenty five. Uh, it is, and like I said, about uh, just under uh, ten full time nutritionists, basically formulating diets for customers. Which is uh, the other part of our mandate is ensuring that people feed their horses uh, a balanced diet, uh, that the horses are getting exactly what they need and uh, nothing extra or not a lot extra. And uh, so you, Perfect. you know, providing the best we can for the horses. That sounds really great. Like I, I love your company because yeah, you have so many convenient options for easy, quick shipping and the prices are great. Uh, with regards to like the research, I know you're doing a program through Guelph, I think it was uh, for, for the research stuff. What, what, uh, if you don't mind talking about it, what stuff are you kind of jump starting as the first few things that you want to pursue more information on? So I mean, there's, there's always the, uh, you know, the testing products or I guess products are, you know, the the research where you're like, okay, does what does this th what does this compound do in the horse? And, and those are great. Those are great research products, and we do partake in those. But what I really want to do is create a mechanistic dynamic model of, you know. The horse, essentially, the physiology, you know, things like being able to predict intake. Right now, just to give you an example of what, what that really means, we use the body weight of a horse to predict their intake. Like I'm sure most people, most of your listeners will be familiar with all oh, we feed, you know, horse will eat 2% of its body weight. Yeah. And that's a core, that's certainly a correlation uh, that we have, but that is not what um, regulates feed intake. There's feedback loops based on, you know, the physical characteristics of the feed, the chemical characteristics, characteristics of the feed. And what you can do with mathematical models is start to define all of that. And really, you know, we use this in all other agricultural species, but we don't use it in horses uh, up to now. There was one attempt, or I shouldn't say attempt, you know, there was one model uh, built, but uh, really nothing else is out there now. And to be able to describe something mathematically it means that you really have a more fundamental understanding. And the great thing about that is then if you have this foundation where you've described all the different processes, whether it be intake, nutrient uptake, whether it's minerals, site of digestion for carbohydrates, protein, which, uh, you know, we kind of overlook in terms of where it gets digested and the impact it may have in the small, in, not in the small intestine, but in the hindgut when it hits there. And these types of things, you have this model and it, uh, it allows us, without necessarily doing big research projects, to predict the outcomes of different feeding programs. And it also, what it really does, is directs re research programs 
to where the big holes are, where you know there's where there's a real lack of understanding. Because if we can't describe it mathematically, it means we don't really understand. And so this foundational kind of model can be a platform for so many different levels of research to kind of springboard off of and give it really give it direction versus uh, just kind of piecemealing a whole, you know, somebody's interested in, oh, what does this carbohydrate do or what does this feed do uh, to give it that kind of foundation to go from. And then, and part of the issue with like with things like this is they're big, like it's a huge undertaking. It costs a lot of money and there's no net immediate benefit to it. Like, you know, from a private company standpoint, you can't say, oh, I'm going to market this, you know, a year from now or even two years from now, uh, which is why it doesn't get done really. Uh, so not to be too altruistic about this, but this, you know, it's why we're doing it. Um, it's one, it needs to be done. And two, I think like, you know, the industry as a whole is going to benefit. So mm -hmm. horse owners, horses in particular are all going to benefit from this uh, project. That sounds really awesome. I'm glad like I'd like there I think in recent years there's been so many more um like research studies coming out on horses because before it was harder to find like a lot of information that's readily available to the average person. Uh so the more companies contribute to that the better it is and that's really exciting that you guys have so many cool things in the works. Um the next question that I have for you is related to like equine nutrition and it's from uh, one of my Patreon subscribers, they were just wondering um, what your opinion on force feeding salt, where you like mix it into their grain versus free feeding it, uh, because they mentioned that they had read a pretty convincing article against force feeding it. That's not equine specific, but it was about other mammals. So they wanted your opinion on what you think the best method of getting the salt in their diet is. Technically, if you're just mixing it in their feed and the horse has the option to eat the feed or not, you're not technically force feeding it, right? I mean, the horse will still, if, like if you mix it all in the feed and the horse consumes it, the horse needs it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not that in itself is not really force feeding. If you're talking about syringing in like electrolytes or salts, um, you know, there's purpose to that too from, a, I, I don't know, again, I want to kind of focus on what the question's asking, uh, but you can you can force feed them that way and as long as they have access to water and it's within reason the amount you're giving them that shouldn't be an issue because they'll drink enough water to balance out the salt you're giving them the bigger issue we have with the horses quite frankly is we don't give them enough salt and so some horses don't like loose free choice salt so mixing it in their feed is actually a better option because it gets them consuming it, it gets them drinking more water uh, I think I said this on our previous conversation where salt's probably the number one nutrient in terms of colic prevention that you're going to feed because <clears throat> if you're not feeding enough salt, the horse is gonna, not going to drink enough. And it's particularly if you get into colder climates and the horse is not drinking enough, um, usually manure is going to, you know, the, the feed in the digestive tract is going to start to dry out to some extent and you start getting things like impaction colic or different types of colics that can rear up. So I don't necessarily like... The reason I always, we always suggest loose free choice salt off to the side is because that way you're sure the horse eats the meal. So whatever's in that meal that you're trying to provide, uh, you haven't, like if you provide too much salt, the horse may be like, oh, I don't want to eat this because I don't actually need this salt. And so then it doesn't eat the entire the entirety of the meal. So you're better off having it loose. Now, when you said that, you know, mixing a bit of salt into any meal will, will, will make it more palatable. Um, so whether that salt's coming through a mineral and vitamin supplement, like um we, we provide or whatever you're doing it's just a matter of making sure it's not too much um and there's a little bit in there and then again with having the loose free choice salt off the side and allowing the horse to select it and choose when it wants to consume that salt i think what one of the things particularly when you do in comparative physiology if you're talking about humans or any other mammal for that matter nothing matches the horse in terms of the amount of salt they excrete through sweat uh, horses have the highest sweat rate of any uh, mammal that we know of, um, essentially, and in in their sweat contains a much higher concentration of salt than it does in human uh, sweat. So, when you know when people look at like human studies with like electrolyte replacement or you know gate you know using Gatorade in human studies, they're not comparable to what you need to do with a horse when you're talking about uh, fluid or electrolyte replacement. So, 
you know, back to the original question, do you want to force feed them? Uh, yeah, there should be some mixed in the feed, but then there should also be loose free choice salt so the horse can select from it. And you should be monitoring as well, because mm -hmm. if you're going long periods of time, the horse is not consuming salt, you should figure out why. Yeah. Uh, and compare that to water intake as well. You know, you know these something, these are kind of like very easy things to monitor, to monitor health, like your water intake, your um, yeah. you know, feed, total salt intake. So is your preference to feed loose salt over like a salt lick because it's easier to monitor the intake of the loose salt or is there is it do you find that horses find the loose salt more palatable? It's not necessarily they find it more palatable it's just that they can get enough. Um, mm -hmm. I mean it's salt so it's in terms of palatability it's, it's the same. It's just like if you have a horse that's doing any level of work or it's in a hot environment a lot of times a block they simply can't lick enough off of it mm -hmm. to meet the requirements and so from loose salt they can mm -hmm. easily get quite a bit and you know, if you take a horse that uh, has not had any access to salt and then you throw a whole bunch out, you'll you'll be surprised how much they'll eat in a, mm -hmm. in a go uh, just because they've been deprived of it for so long. As long and again, as always, you, you always want free access to water. You never mm -hmm. want to give up salt without access to water. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's a really good answer because I yeah I hadn't actually heard of any of the articles on like force feeding salt, but I had I like I put it in my horse's dinner and they have. Uh, free choice salt so I was wondering because they get they do get less in their food but I also noticed that they like the taste of their food better when there's salt in it so I season it <laughs> with salt now um so just to just to raise a point here like I think this is super important when it comes to salt because on the human nutrition side you'll hear constantly about too much sodium intake and you know things like high blood pressure negatively impacting your health um is your horse for the most part doesn't eat processed food and so it's not getting sodium I mean, that's mm -hmm. where the most of the human diet comes from, sodium. So, yeah, seasoning the feed is great. And then, you know, providing more. Because, you know, what? if you put too much salt in the feed, they just won't eat it. Yeah. Be like, no, it was too much. Perfect. But a nice that's seasoning awesome. amount is perfect. Yeah. So then I have another question that is about, um, someone's asking about the Mad Barn amino trace, like for feeding to horses. Can you, like, what types of horses would you recommend that for? Because they have one that has hoof issues and they were wondering if like both of the horses they have could have it or if it's like specific for horses that have um hoof issues or other problems that you're targeting with the amino trace supplement you know amino trace can be fit to any horse uh, it's just it comes back to does it balance the diet where you need to so i mean where it originated from the formulation came from um doing custom formulas for people with ir horses or that had chronic kind of high iron intake and so you know, we selected a phosphorus source that has next to no iron in it. Um, and then we bumped up the zinc and copper and some of the amino acids for, because we knew these horses would be getting much lower quality hay than your average horse. And so that's, the, that's you know, the, the formulation difference between amino trace. Now, the only thing I will say is there's no added calcium. And, the you know, sometimes we get kicked back on this. We're like, well, it needs to be, you know, two to one calcium to phosphorus. And that's the whole diet that needs to be two to one. So... Most hays are well over two to one calcium to phosphorus, but there are some that are, you know, one to one uh, cal phosphorus ratio. And so you do need to be cognizant of what other ingredients you're feeding with amino trace. Um, like 98% of the diets, it's quite all right to, to feed with them. I've seen the odd one where you do need some supplemental calcium. And so that would be the only time I would say don't use amino trace is okay. if you had cool. low known calcium hay. Okay, and then this uh, this is another question from the same person, and this is just a it's about um, different uh, flowers that horses can find in their environment, and they wanted to know do lupin flowers really make horses high? I, and I, I looked up some of them, and like, are all of them toxic to horses? Then, like, any lupin, or is it just certain ones? And um, what? Yeah. <laughs> You're actually asking the wrong guy. My botany is terrible, but uh, no, <laughs> you, you'd say, well, he's a nutritionist. She should absolutely know this. Um, yeah, I actually, I mean, I'd have to go back and actually look at some studies on this. Um, make them high. Depends. Sorry, I don't actually. I know some of that. like, yeah, there's certain like psychedelic plants that animals can eat because I know spider grass is one of them and my cat eat like I had to throw out my spider plant because my cat was eating it and then apparently they hallucinate when they eat it um but it's not n toxic technically but it's not good for them but yeah int I don't know the answer to that question either so I was just like interesting um we'll, uh, then, we'll write that down and yeah. we'll uh, look it up for you maybe next time back 
Or we can uh, maybe in the notes give you a better answer later. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I can, I can, I, I can post a note about it after too to let them know once we look into it further. Um, I guess my next question too would be, uh, we talked about this a bit last time too, but um, it related to like making a a balanced, correct diet. There is like a huge, um, like belief in the horse world that you need to feed grain in order to do that, especially with like thoroughbreds and like sport horses and other horses who are perceived as harder keepers. So I wanted to hear your opinion on that and uh, yeah, talk about that. Cause that's one of the biggest misconceptions that I hear personally, where um, people believe it so hard that I've even had people be like, Oh, I'll never let you have my thoroughbred because you'd starve them if they didn't get grain. And I was like, yeah, you know, if you're providing lots of free choice forage, a horse is not going to starve. Yeah. Uh, again, it, you know, it comes back to the forage matching what the horse is doing. So just because it's a thoroughbred or a quarter horse, obviously, yeah, they have different metabolic rates, basal metabolic rates. And so their energy demands could be slightly different, but it's not like no horse needs concentrate per se. Uh, if you take good quality fresh pasture, I mean, it has more energy than oats does. I mean, so your well, ponies will just explode on like mm -hmm. fresh pasture, right? They'll turn into, and a, and a thoroughbred will maintain itself quite happily on uh, pasture. So it's, it's just a matter of matching your forage source to what the horse is doing, and it's just natural metabolic rate. Now, like, if you take a horse off the track that's been getting gallons and of grain a day. You're going to have to change the diet slowly like you can't just expect to be like we're going to just stop this diet the horse is getting previously and change it to like just nothing but forage like you want to taper that down now unfortunately that doesn't always happen because the horse has changed hands and people don't know what it was getting fed before um, but ideally it would be a very tapering situation allowing the hind gut to adjust to the changes and the other thing is being patient um when making dietary changes, but it is there is no issue maintaining horses without I guess grain or concentrate. There's lots of soluble fiber sources out there that are very high in energy, and then there's always fat you can add to the diet, which will always boost up the energy, which is the way we tend to go. Um, there are scenarios where you're like, okay, well, a little bit of grain's okay, like oats or something, a bit of starch. Like if you're a um, hundred mile endurance horse, like you may want to boost a little bit in there, but uh, for the most part, not there's no need. There's and there's good studies even on standard bred racehorses, which we consider like very heavy exercise, uh, keeping them on 100% forage diets at full racing training, uh, and the the horse is doing just fine, no loss of uh, productivity at all. That's so cool. Um, and then I guess my next question relating to the forage would be like between like like for feeding like soaked forage options in addition to regular hay so like for example like with feeding your supplements i mix it into like beet pulp um or soaked alfalfa or timothy cubes between those options which would you say has like the highest source of energy uh that would be the best to kind of add into the diet if the horse needs more calories or more energy for their job a uh, beet pulp is going to be about the highest source of energy from fiber you can get that's readily available um it's it's a close it's close to basically feeding oats in terms of what the horse will drive from derive in terms of energy from it so uh like you know to the previous point there's really no need for grains because if you do need to boost the energy you add some beet pulp and this is often what we you know our recommendations go is add beet pulp add a bit of flax uh ground flax and then if the energy requirements are still not being met then start adding fat slash oil like oil fats the same thing right um mm -hmm. starting add it to the diet to meet their caloric needs Perfect. That's yeah, really good to know. I guess like I think a lot of people just underestimate the amount of energy horses can get from fiber because we're it, it's so it's been especially like growing up in like the English world and with sport horses like Arabians and thoroughbreds, it gets so drilled into your head that they like need to have grain that if they don't have grain, they're gonna like suffer and not be able to do their jobs. But yeah, it's one of those things that as like when I stopped feeding it, my horses have never been easier keepers now that they're off grain versus on it. They like couldn't hold it. What It seemed like they couldn't hold their weight. Um, now they're much more stable. So it, it's been a really cool process to kind of make that adjustment and see the difference it makes. I think, I think for some people's uh, perception gets skewed a little bit in terms of like, oh, they have to have grain is a lot of times they're not being fed enough forage, right? Like mm -hmm. if 
you know, somebody drops two to three flakes in the hay in at night, say at even six or seven p.m., and they come in in the morning, early, and it's all gone. But they're like, well, so that that's enough. But it should have been like two to three times that. And then the other, you know, especially in boarding barns, you find a lot of, well, we don't want any wasted hay. And so they don't, yeah. you know, when they come to clean the stalls, they want all the hay gone. Which, again, you know, can lead to issues because if they're running out of hay for long periods of time, then you get, uh, you know, there's other stressors that start to kick in. Like it's not, then you start to move away from just pure nutrition, right? Like if the horse is without forage for a long time and they start, um, you know, chewing on boards, developing stereotypies, just generally stressing, well, their metabolic rate or requirement, energy requirement is going to go up and they're not going to do as well. Like anybody under stress, even if you're meeting their caloric needs, doesn't look as well as somebody who's more relaxed. Um, and, the, you know, it's the same for horses. So, again, it's it's just the combination of meeting their nutritional needs, but also, you know, meeting their um, psychological needs. And that, you know, that really comes from forage and being able to eat for the majority of the day. Yeah, that, yeah, that's awesome. And I, yeah, I agree with most boarding barns. Very few of them that I have heard of personally actually feed free choice hay. They'll do like per flake feeding. Um, and usually it's only like six flakes a day, especially with the hay shortages. I think people are getting even more stingy on forage, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I, I would agree with that as well with the hay thing. I see that a lot, like as a trainer, and it's one of the biggest causes of behavioral issues um, that I've personally been exposed to. And it's frustrating because you can't really train your way out of a horse being starving from not having enough hay and like having a sore stomach because of it. But then when they're feeding enough grain, they don't see it as an issue because the horse isn't losing weight, but they're still like hungry. Um, and yeah, that's one of the biggest misconceptions I think I see as a trainer. I, I, I make the analogy of it would be the equivalent of like feeding, a, you know, us, but just with bacon and butter, essentially. It wouldn't take very much to meet your total caloric needs, right? But you would be hungry all the time uh, like because you'd just be eating such energy energy dense food. And the horse was really built not to eat energy dense food at all. It was, you know, it's built to survive on actually very poor quality fodder as long as they have access to it a lot um, and to the ability to consume a lot of it. And then as owners, we just need to make adjustments, you know, selecting basically the forages that uh, meet their needs for what we're trying to do with them. Mm -hmm. Um, then regarding forage, I had another question that's kind of really like horses as foraging animals. I know in like a natural situation, if you had grass pasture and stuff, they'd be able to eat like lots of different types of plants um, and different types of grasses and whatnot. So what's your opinion like with haze? Like, do you think that people should be giving them different types of hay so that they can kind of forage on different types of things uh or setting up like like i I've, i'm trying to make an herb garden for my horses for example more as like an enrichment activity than for like specific nutrition but just to give them some other things to kind of investigate and taste do you like is that something that's important for nutrition or like welfare or like general like mental health for the horse or is it less important well, I, I think like anything, like a little bit of variety. So this, you know, you're getting into areas that aren't well studied in horses. And so now you're you're using, you know, essentially logic to say, well, this makes sense. If we give the horse a little more variety, obviously the nutrient composition of these plants are very different depending on what the plant is and the species. And so now the horse can go in the taste too, right? The taste is going to vary a lot because when you, you know, even when you talk about haze, when you go from Timothy to orchard to say brome grass, you know, they're different. Um, but the not as different as when you get into the realm of like different completely different species of plants and even weeds right like dandelions and things mm -hmm. like that horses will eat and, uh, there's nothing actually nutritionally from a nutrition standpoint there's nothing wrong with dandelions um so there there isn't a lot of good research to say this you know this is a good way to go but from just uh you know thinking through it logically as long as there's no toxic uh, plants in there then i think it's a very good way to go there's actually an old uh, dairy researcher, Van Soest, who had students in Italy. They were trying to figure out why the butter tasted so good at this one region and how it had this very distinct flavor in the, in the butter. And so he basically had students just sit and watch the cows uh, browse all afternoon. So, you know, some in the southern part of Italy, it must have been a tough job for the students to sit yeah. there in their chairs and like monitor what, the, what these cows were eating. 
but it was interesting. They, you know, they learned a lot observing just what the cows would do. These cows would specifically select plants that were very high in acetosilic acid, which was aspirin, right before they would lay down and go ruminate. And so, it, you know, it's a hard thing to prove, but you're trying to make the make the point of well, it probably you know provides some uh, pain relief. Not that they're in pain, but uh, you know, some relief or by eat, consuming plants high in acetosilic acetosilic acid while they're trying to lay down and ruminate. And then they would also select these really, really spicy plants, which which was actually what imparted the flavor into the butter. Uh, and that's what they eventually found out was some of the compounds in these very specific plants that were uh, specific to the region these cattle were in was what was imparting all this flavor into the butter. Uh, so animals do will definitely go select different things. And then there's like people, they have preferences. There's some things they do like, some things they don't like. So giving them a variety is, a, I think, is a great option. Uh, and you see more and more of this. People are doing uh, fun experiments with planting different types of pastures uh, to do exactly what you were talking about, you know, planting a herb garden or mm -hmm. different things for the horse to select through. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It, uh, from a balancing standpoint, it gets a little more difficult because you have a wide variety of plants now that may have very, very different uh, nutritional makeup, which, I mean, it's already hard enough to predict like what a horse is consuming from pasture uh, when you're doing nutritional balancing. Uh, it's going to get even harder when you introduce even more species, but ultimately you're still going to need some level of supplementation uh, in terms of just meeting mineral uh, requirements, even with a different variety pack uh, well, in your pastures. Cool. That, yeah, that's a really, that's really informative. Uh, and this is still pertaining to hay because I have a lot of hay based questions since it's the the majority of the diet. Uh, so there's like, there's so many different types of hay on the market. And like I fed Timothy, I fed orchard grass right now, like right now I'm feeding local hay, but like everyone is selling out of our local hay here. So yeah. we like our, and our local mixes is just, they're, they're lower quality, like really stocky. Um, and the reason why I went off Timothy is because my youngster was getting bad diarrhea when he was on Timothy in specific. And it was like, I tried, I took him on and off of it a couple of times to see if what was inciting the diarrhea and it seemed to be Timothy. So, um, and it was a lower sugar Timothy too. And it was one that he has eaten before. Uh, and not had diarrhea, but then for whatever reason, this past year's cut, he he didn't ag didn't agree with him. So for something like that, like what would you say? Like when horses have like loose stool, is it typically um, like can they can they I guess just not agree with a certain type of hay, or is it usually due to like mineral imbalances um, or getting too much of something? Yeah, this is a great question. It could be a lot. It could be all those things. I mean. There's entire Facebook pages dedicated to like horses with diarrhea or free fecal water syndrome. And certainly like when you talk about really stocky, low quality Timothy, like there does seem to be some evidence that that uh, predisposes some horses to getting diarrhea. And then not hundred percent sure why, but I think part of it is actually you're, we're almost gone the inverse of, or the opposite of what we've been trying to avoid for so long when we talked about starch overload in the hindgut and all these, you know, acidosis in the hindgut. Well, you can also starve the bacteria in the hindgut, right? Like if there's just not enough fermentable material there for them, you essentially starve those bacteria where you know, just even throwing a bit of fermentable goods in there, whether it be like, you know, alfalfa cubes or some bee pulp sometimes, sometimes can, you know, be enough to offset it. And then I think there's also just the physical nature. It gets so stemmy, particularly with some of the really fine, like Timothy with has the fine stems that they can get quite physically uh, hard probably for the horse uh, in the hind gut as well, even though, you know, they do a good job chewing it. But, but you do see with like, certainly higher incidence of free fecal water syndrome and when you get into some really low quality haze particularly the more stemmy type haze like timothy uh, and so in those cases it's probably best just to find a little better high, a little higher quality or different type of hay okay, that's interesting because I, I thought that the more fibrous it would be it would help keep their poos together but that makes sense that like yeah because that like oh, he he's been on nicer hay before too and he's been okay on it but then the last few timothys that we've gotten even the nice like fine stuff he, it's not hit the same so we just i'll keep experimenting because the local he never gets diarrhea on so it's weird because it's just yeah timothy and he also eats alfalfa too and it doesn't seem to bother him at all so it's yeah interesting 
Yeah, it's it's funny. Like alfalfa, yeah, it rarely seems to cause issues in fed in moderation. But uh, the more flat like type grasses, I think you have less issue with. They're just physically a lot softer um, mm-hmm. than you get with timothy, which is can be quite stemmy. Yeah, so it's the softness of the hay, even though it's like technically less fibrous, it would help hold the poo together more if it's not irritating their stomach. Then, is that kind of is? Yeah, it could be. I mean, it's certainly going to be part of it. And again, it could be just the interaction too with uh, the microbial population being able to access actual nutrients out of that uh, um, the particular hay. Cool. Yeah, that's really good to know. Um, and then related to like orchard grass and stuff, I guess, like what, like, I, I suppose it depends on the area, like your geographic location for like the, um, for like the, the, nutritional makeup of the specific grasses but like what would like what would your preferred type of hay be like if you were going to feed what would you say the most successful overall type of hay that you like the one that most closely meets the horse's actual needs is the most successful so I, i don't think necessarily um there's one type of hay that wins out over another one is, you know, there's Kentucky bluegrass, the famous bluegrasses that you get down in Kentucky, which are, you know, can be wonderful forages and pasture for horses uh, versus, you know, a really coarse Timothy obviously is not the ideal situation if it gives your horse diarrhea and it's causing issues. Uh, so it's, it's more about which one most closely meets your horse's needs. So again, kind of going through, and they talk about this a lot, the calculation of, you know, my horse needs to eat 12 hours a day. So if that means it's going to eat 10 to 12 kilos of this hay. Where does that land from an energy and a protein standpoint when I feed this hay? Now, if it was pure alfalfa, it'd be way too much protein and way too much energy for almost all horses. So you're like, well, that's not an ideal situation. If it was pure Timothy that was harvested at the end of August in Ontario or even BC, you know, first cut, that's probably not an ideal forage for almost any horse either reason be so low in protein and so low in energy and be so fibrous that that's not an ideal situation. Uh, but when it comes to speciation or different species of, again, it's just about matching what the horse actually needs. And so generally mixes are nice, right? Because mm-hmm. you get, uh, you get a little bit of variety, uh, mixed in there with some, you know, not just, well, there really are no pure stands of Timothy. I mean, there's usually grasses mixed in with them or, or other grasses. Um, but blends are usually the best way to go. And then it comes down to agronomics too, right? Like what grows best in your region? What, you know, if you're using it for a pasture as well, like what's going to tolerate the traffic uh, and things like that. And it's, it's a combination of matching all those things up. That's really, yeah, that's really neat. Uh, so then I guess the other question too would be like for forage, you don't really want to cut forage out of the diet where they're not eating for extended periods of time so for people who have horses that are fat uh and get (laughs) fat off of low quality hay um other than like slow feed nets and like grazing muzzles and whatnot is there anything else you'd suggest uh or would it just kind of be exercise and upping the amount of calories that they're burning if you can't reduce the hay without fasting them yeah i mean it's okay to like if you have the ability to um feed more frequently you can let them go without forage for a couple of hours you know up to we kind of say like four is the max without forage like particularly because again it comes this balancing act of if the horse is overweight and it's become laminitic if you keep feeding it overfeeding it well you got to balance that with being without forage for a little bit is probably still a better option than having that you know the laminitic outcome and so and then there's options too like straw like you can blend straw into your slow hay, uh, slow feeder net. So if your hay is a little too high quality, cut the hay mount down and blend in a little bit of chopped straw. There's a few companies around now that are uh, chopping. And they, they're selling it as bedding, but the, oh yeah, yeah, like feed. the simply straw and stuff. Yeah, like in, the nice thing is they've chopped it. It's dust extracted usually, so it's uh, you don't want it too fine. You just want to make sure it's not too fine. Uh, that can cause problems too. But uh, most of it's relatively uh, good to feed. And that makes a nice alternative, right? Like if your hay's a little too high quality, you don't have another option. You need to really uh, keep feed in front of them all the time. And then, as you mentioned, exercise is always, always the, uh, is getting the amount of exercise in the horse is a great way to compensate as well. And there's a, there's a lot of other benefits to it as well, particularly when you talk about insulin resistance and things like that. Exercise is just going to make the horse more insulin sensitive no matter what. Uh, and so any level of, improving or increasing the amount of exercise the horse is doing is going to be beneficial for the health and honestly it's 
it's usually beneficial for the owner too. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, and this is still regarding hay because I found this out recently. Um, in, in like where I live in Canada specifically, despite how wet it is here, feeding haylage is like a big no no here. But I heard that in like the UK and Ireland that they feed haylage because they can't get enough of like a dry season to have consistently dry hay. Is there a is there like a safe way to do that, or is the risk of botulism always going to be there, um, regardless? Yeah, I mean it's always going to be there. Sure, there's going to be a risk of botulism. Uh, there are vaccines um, that you can give. Yeah, I mean you really need like if you were going to feed haylage, and you knew the person at harvesting it, you just basically you want them to cut it a little higher, get it up off the ground a little bit, because that's mainly, you know, it's picking up dead animals is how you're going to get the botulism into it. So as long as you can avoid that, uh, it's it's perfectly fine to feed. You know, again, talking about horses that may be uh, overweight, the great thing about fermenting the feed is you took all the sugar out of it, right? You, get, you basically fed the bacteria on the sugar, so you've at least reduced that. So the total caloric content of haylage it would be lower than a dry hay harvested at the same time. Uh, cool. So now most hay is harvested much earlier than most dry hay. So the, you have to, you do have to be careful that, um, it, you know, a lot of hay will be higher energy than the average horse. Eh? I could probably have to spend about a good chunk of time walking through explaining all that. And I'm not sure it's worth. Yeah, no, that, <laughs> that's time, really, but, it's, it's cool to know. Cause it was just something that like a, I've just been told like, Oh, don't let their hay get wet. Basically if it's going to sit and potentially ferment because yeah, botulism, botulism, but all of mine have their botulism, but even with like round bales, I've had people say it because of like the concern, I if like in the center of them, if they get fermenting and uh, gross. So I, I started doing the vaccines just out of fear of that. But I, yeah, it was interesting to hear that they do it so differently elsewhere. Well, there's a there's a big difference between having hay that's baled too wet and then actually purposely making haylage. Because what what will end up happening is if you're make if you're trying to make hay, but it's just not going well and everything's getting too wet. That's a bad thing to feed to your horses, just because the amount of mold and stuff that's going to grow, you're not going to get a proper fermentation. So I mean, those are two very different kind of. Uh, areas you're talking about like if you're making you're striving to make hay that you're going to make it wetter uh, so it does ferment because you need water activity to make the fermentation happen yeah. versus a hay that's just getting wet or rained on uh, is probably you're going to want to avoid feeding that to your horse yeah. as possible is there like a certain percentage of like moisture that's ideal for like a haylage for horses or like I, I just wondering like how it would differ from cows because most of the people I know here that feed haylage they're almost all cattle farmers. So, um, and, and I know that cows can eat a lot more things safely than horses seem to be able to, uh, just seeing what they feed cows and not having them colic and die. So, uh, yeah, is there like a, is there a sweet spot for moisture for horses or is it the same as with cows? Yeah, it really, like the moisture content really comes down to the fermentation process. It's not so much about the animal you're feeding, and so it comes down to how, like, are you are you making a big round bale, a square bale, and then wrapping it in plastic? Those tend to be much drier. You know, you'd be in that kind of uh, fifty to sixty-five percent dry matter range, which doesn't create an optimal environment for fermentation. Uh, it's like that's pretty dry, um, but people do it and do it successfully. So. And if you were going to feed a horse haylage, that's probably actually going to hit your sweet spot just because if it gets too wet, it can get a little, um, you also get fermentations that kind of deviate from what you would consider optimal. Like you really want to drive a lactic acid fermentation. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity in there when you get things wrong to get them going different ways, whether it be yeast molds or just uh, bacteria that you don't necessarily want growing in there. So for most horses, you're going to probably be in that 45 to 65 percent dry matter range if you're putting it in bales and probably leaning more towards the 65. Uh, I don't know of anybody that puts haylage in a bunk for horses, but if you're putting it into a bunker or a silo, it would be lower still. You'd be in that 35 to 45 percent dry matter range. Cool. Yeah, interesting. It's just I, I had no idea people fed it to horses until very recently. <laughs> I've only seen it for cows um and like we don't get it because like it, it's almost impossible to move the bales by hand at all <laughs> if you don't have a tractor um so and we can't even you can't even roll them like we i've gotten a haylage bale by accident once and it bent the entire frame of like my truck tailgate when we tried to get it off of the 
truck. So yeah, interesting. But yeah, thank thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, th I have I think I have one more question, and then I, I know this is like I, I I keep asking a million things, but it's it's so interesting. I love all the equine nutrition stuff. Um, and this is about babies now because. I like regarding alfalfa, like a feeding lots and lots of alfalfa is pretty common in the racing world, but <laughs> I've heard from some people that too much alfalfa in the diet can contribute to like OCD lesions and issues with growth, um, in young horses. Is that true? Or is it, is it only in like mass excess? Yeah. You asked a bit, that's a bit of a loaded question because nobody really knows exactly what causes OCDs. I mean, there's definitely uh, research pointing towards excessive growth rates uh, when you grow young animals too fast. And so being strictly alfalfa may lead to that, uh, especially if you're feeding grain on top of it, just because of the high alfalfa tends to be higher in energy than uh, what you call traditional horse aids. And I, I'm going to put a caveat in here because these are some of the common things we throw around as we talk about horse nutrition and oh alfalfa is higher in energy and protein than grass hay that's only true again based on dates of harvest like most typical horse hay gets harvested quite mature as grasses and so the energy and protein content of grass drops precipitously as it matures much faster than alfalfa does as it matures whereas if you get a young grass uh hay it will be much higher energy and protein not much higher in protein but much higher in energy than alfalfa will depending on the species. Um, so again, it really, some of the generalizations we make about haze and types of haze are exactly that, just generalizations. It's not necessarily uh, true if you take them across all scenarios. And so I wouldn't, like a young animal, you could probably be a fairly high alfalfa diet, like 50-50, just again, because of the protein, uh, the minerals that are in it, and just getting enough energy into a young animal with an immature digestive system. And then you would, you know, ratchet that down and go more grass hay as they uh, became more mature, more able to digest uh, uh, sure forages or grass hays. But I don't like. I don't know. If there's any strong evidence saying if you feed 100% alfalfa that that contributes to OCDs. But again, I think one of the major contributors to OCDs is just too high growth rates, having animals too heavy, uh, yeah. and not enough mineral nutrition in young animals. Cool. Yeah, that's really good to know. Um, I lied. I have one more question. This is about yeah, pasture because okay. you mentioned like the growth rate of the grass. So for horses, if you're using grass pasture. Is there like an ideal like length of grass or time in the year that you should be putting them out so that you're not throwing them out on like really young high sugar grass? Um, or how do you kind of just gauge that by looking at it? Yeah, you want the grass to be a little bit longer, a little bit more mature, just so you know there's a little more fiber in it. Like essentially the shorter the grass, the more immature the grass, the higher the sugar content, the higher the protein, the higher the energy. Uh, is going to be so if you let it get a little longer up to like you know five six eight inches uh, you're gonna have more fiber in there and less sugar now again time of day has a huge impact on the amount of sugar that's in pasture so you never want to just take a horse especially you know being from canada where you go from winter to spring and uh, obviously everybody knows the issues that happen when you just throw a horse on pasture you want to introduce it slowly and you want to start in the morning Right, because it hasn't uh, basically the plants used up a lot of the sugars overnight um, and it hasn't started photosynthesis yet. So let the horse graze for a couple hours in the morning and just slowly increase the amount of time. And again, it comes back to level of work. So if you have a horse that's doing nothing, uh, particularly in BC or actually for most of Canada, our grasses, our cool season grasses are just too rich to leave a horse on them 24 7 if they're not doing anything. Um, particularly if there's lots of grass. And mm -hmm. so you either need to dry lot them for some portion of the time or uh, put them in pasture that's just really, really poor. This is just not a lot of fodder out there for them. Uh, and again, you know, pasture management is the same as any other forage management. It's about matching up with what the horse is doing. You know, 100 mile endurance horse, by all means, should be grazing all day long in nice pasture that's six to eight inches. You should be using, you know, strategies like rotational grazing. So you're optimizing the, the the fodder that's actually out there for them to eat so they can really like consume a lot. Um, a horse with insulin resistance, you 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 know, you're really gonna probably be to the point of very limited pasture access. And so it's a it's a spectrum. And then again, to answer your question, you definitely want at least like a good four inches of growth in there. Perfect. And, and you don't want to let them eat it down too low either just from the standpoint of regrowth, right? Like 
and you see it so much in the horse world <laughs> just poor pastures that are spotty and there's weeds growing everywhere and um you can you can mitigate all that with different strategies whether it be strip grazing just rotational uh using different paddocks uh things like that to keep the pasture uh, doing well and robust that's awesome. Yeah, really good to know. I have more access to grass this year, so I always like to know. Like, we usually don't throw them out too early because they destroy the grass with how wet it is here anyways. So by the time most people put their horses out, I would say the grass is at least four inches, probably more like six to ten, um, yeah. depending on where, just because otherwise, like, they punch holes straight through the ground because it's just so boggy. Um but yeah, like the, the, and the morning versus night difference in sugar is also important for like when people choose to leave horses out. Cause I know some people do nighttime turnout to not have horses sun bleach, but then if they're eating way more sugar because they're out overnight, that's less ideal. So that, that's really good to know. No, yeah. Again, the, the horse is exercising enough. They can, they can tolerate it. Right. Um, and then particularly if it's late at night where they're going to, you're starting to get some, uh, it takes quite a bit. It's not past midnight by the time the sugars really start to drop off. But uh, yeah, again, you, you don't want to be doing that if your horse is doing nothing. Yeah. Just putting them out there and predisposing, predisposing the high levels of sugar intake all the time. Cool. Yeah, no, that's really good to know. That gives people lots of things to think about. So yeah, thank you again for fielding so many questions because there were lots. Um, but yeah, there's always going to be tons because nutrition is honestly one of the, the things I get asked about the most. And I think the learning curve for it is pretty steep, especially since most horse people board their horses and you don't really get taught like, a, like a, at least in my experience when I was boarding people didn't really take the initiative to tell you why they put your horse on the food that they're feeding. And it's kind of, you're kind of just at the mercy of like your trainer or your barn owner telling you what to do, even if they themselves don't know what they're doing. Um, so it, it's hard. It's a hard thing to kind of pick up. And I, that's why I like Mad Barn so much because you guys put out so much free information for people to learn about like what is such a staple in horse ownership. Yeah. And uh, I mean, we provide, Free diet evaluation so again if you're ever unsure just in, in the models free like you we will input the data so you can look at it um, yourself and uh, yeah if you're ever unsure it's best well you should always do diet evaluations for your horse i mean this is the one thing that and i think part of what happens with uh you know we, we almost love pet food like dogs and cats and horses kind of all together and how we care for them nutritionally and you go buy dog food and everything's in that bag right but when you're with your horse it's the majority of its diets is forage and you have no idea what's in it. And so you, you do need uh, help balancing that out. Yeah, for sure. So for a little, sorry, one more question about testing the forages, I guess. I know how you test hay that people have those like cone things that they insert like right into the middle of the bale to pull out like yeah. the center of it. But for, if you wanted to like test a grass pasture, would you just like pull up some grass by the root and send that in? Or how does that work? Like, um, no, well, what you want to do is actually clip it. The idea, uh, you don't actually, well, your horses will pull it up by the root, especially if it's really good, it's bare. But uh, ideally what you want to do is just clip it with scissors. So you okay. take quadr you take quadrants, like basically take a square uh, and then clip with a pair of scissors, put it in the bag, and then just move around to a bunch of spots in the pasture and do that over and over. Now, there is this caveat. If you're going to take pasture clippings, uh, it will start to ferment almost immediately. So it's so particularly a lot of people I find I want to do their pasture want to know what the sugar levels are, uh, which is fine. But you need to freeze the sample almost immediately. You need to get the lab frozen, or uh, you can dry it yourself. But you need to do it right away because fermentation. In, like you can see in a Ziploc bag if you take fresh pasture and put it in a Ziploc bag, it'll immediately start getting condensation, in, and that's the respiration of the bacteria. Well, and the plant too, not just the bacteria, uh, but. You know it's still a living species even though you've cut it uh, and so it's going to change dramatically over time so it's like if you really want to represent a sample of the carbohydrate fractions in your pasture you, you absolutely have to freeze it okay cool that's good to know because yeah that's what i that would be kind of my next thing to test is getting the grass samples um and yeah i wouldn't have known to freeze them so that's awesome thank you um yeah i think that's all i have today for questions and i'm sure we'll have more if you ever want to do another one of these because <laughs> there's people are very very hungry pun intended for equine nutrition <laughs> knowledge 
Um, and yeah, and it, it truly resolves so many issues. Like there's so many problems that for years I would struggle with my horses that would frustrate me. And it was hard to get accurate help because a lot of people didn't attribute like their hoof issues and like certain behavioral issues or weight issues to being about the diet, especially when they could use like, oh, pull the thoroughbred card. Thoroughbreds are just hard keepers. They just have bad feet, so on and so forth. Um, and it, it made it harder to learn about stuff that way. So being able to like, yeah, put this information out to the masses, I think is fantastic. So thank you again for that. Yeah, no problem. That's what we're here for. So we're more than happy to answer questions and uh, provide as much good information as we can. In life. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Thank you again. And yeah, and for anyone listening, if you want a free diet analysis, you can go to the Mad Barn website and input your horse's diet information and get a response back from their nutritionist team regarding your horse's diet analysis. And yeah, it's free that you heard that right. Um, so check it out <laughs> if you want that uh, for your horses. I highly recommend it. I've done it um, and their supplements are great. My horse's feet look way better. You can see the growth line from when they started their supplements um, and how different the health of their ho hooves are. So um, highly recommend checking that out, even if just for the diet analysis, so you can look at what your horse is getting and what they may be deficient in. Um, yeah. So thank you again, Scott, for joining us on the Making Milestones podcast again. would love to have you back sometime and we'll probably have lots of questions again in the future because there's no shortage of things to ask about equine nutrition. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Shelby. We'll uh, talk soon. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in on today's podcast. I hope that was interesting and informative. I know it sure was for me. Uh, I still have like so many questions that I could have asked and I could have talked Scott's ear off all day. Um, definitely would love to have him back on the podcast another time. So if you guys liked this podcast, please share your thoughts and comments on it uh, so that we can plan this again for the future. If you found any of this information informative and exciting. For those of you who are interested in checking out Mad Barn products, you can go to their website madbarn.ca for Canadians or madbarn.com for Americans and they have the free diet analysis as we have mentioned and also I have a discount code if anyone wants to place an order you can get a discount on your order if you use my code S-D-E-Q-U-U-S S-D-Equus at checkout uh, and highly recommend checking out the diet analysis if you haven't done it yet. They have a lot of great products. My horses are on the Omniety and their Amino Trace. And I also have Milo on their Visceral Plus Ulcer Supplement. So I highly recommend checking them out. Um, as a Canadian, I love the fact that they offer free shipping in Canada. Uh, a lot of companies don't do this and you have to pay an arm and a leg to get products shipped in, especially if it's an American company. Duty and shipping charges to Canada are typically very high. Mad Barn kind of solved that problem for me because it's free shipping for orders over $40. Uh, delivered right to my door and super convenient and easy. Like I, I love having stuff shipped directly from out of Canada because it's just easy. So if you're also a Canadian, um, I recommend this because we don't get screwed with the shipping costs that can come with ordering from American companies. Um, and for Americans too, they offer free shipping for over $40. So it's the best of both worlds. Win, win. Uh, yeah. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this podcast and that it was informative and that you got to take something away from this to, um, further your knowledge of equine nutrition and consider some practices if you decide to change your horse's feed, or if you want to get a diet analysis so that you can, uh, look further into what they are actually getting. Or if you don't own a horse, this is still really good information to learn for the future because diet is such a huge part of horse care and it's one of the most underrated things for people to learn about. So thank you again for tuning in and I hope you enjoyed this. You guys all know where to find me. You can find me on Instagram at S-D-E-Q-U-U-S. Same name on TikTok and Twitter. I also have a Patreon channel that you can subscribe to for as little as a dollar a month for behind the scenes footage. Uh, you can also do some of the higher tiers for free training help and other stuff and my patreon is patreon.com slash s-d-e-q-u-u-s and i post some tutorials and some lengthier training clips on there that do not make it to my youtube channel along with behind the scenes footage and early access to some podcasts and videos um, so i highly recommend checking that out if you haven't yet if you want to get some more tutorials and behind the scenes stuff patreon subscribers also get the chance to submit questions uh, for podcasts like in this case uh, so yeah check it out and thank you again for tuning in i always appreciate 
uh, how much people seem to like this podcast and just the support it gets and the feedback. I really appreciate it. It's so humbling and um, matters more than all, all of you can know. Hope you guys all have a beautiful day and I hope your horses are happy, healthy, and that you got to take something away from this to continue improving your horsemanship and continue the journey of learning. Because uh, yeah, I, I certainly did. Um, so hopefully you guys did too. Thanks. Have a great day.